Well, good afternoon and welcome to the last session of the last day of the conference, of the SU2 conference. So we have uh, the next hour aligned with topics in the area of um, hypersonics, non-equilibrium flow, uh, non-classic equation of state. And so we're going to start with the first talk from uh, Jacob Needles, and he will be talking about uh, surface boundary condition for hypersonic flow simulations. Uh, Jacob, uh, I leave it uh, to you. So you have 15 minutes. I'll give you in 20, two minutes left. That's okay. great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm ready for the to uh, My name is Jacob, and today I'm going to be talking about surface boundary conditions for hypersonic flow simulation. Um, okay, so to start with um, a little bit of motivation, hypersonic flows are characterized by very high temperature. And the design sample is plus in what temperatures, um, typically within uh, constant constraints. Because they typically constitute constraints in the um, hypersonic vehicle design process. So SG2 NEMO is our um, Set of solvers within the code for non equilibrium modeling. It's focused a lot on um, prediction of reacting flows, um, thermodynamics properties for non equilibrium flows, transport properties. Um, and these are really highlighted just in kind of this canonical comparison case over here on the right, which is the comparison of temperature contours for a perfect gas flow over a cylinder and a non equilibrium flow over a cylinder. Um, and you can see that in the non equilibrium flow, you have a much lower peak temperature due to relaxation processes occurring. There's also um, a low, should be a smaller shock standoff distance. Um, so this kind of highlights the importance of capturing this additional physics. Um, but also to predict heat loads and wall temperature specifically, you need accurate physical model at the surface boundary in addition to within the flow field itself. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of some of the boundaries that we currently have in the SU2 NEMO framework. Um, so I want to note that uh, Fabio implemented a slip wall boundary condition for rarefied flows. Um, which you know is a, is a physical model there to capture kind of the non-continuum regime. But here I'm focusing primarily on continuum flows. So this is really the heat flux and isothermal wall boundary conditions. Um, and just to kind of note some of the limitations, right? The heat flux boundary condition allows you to specify a fixed heat flux at the wall. Um, you know, a common choice might be to choose an adiabatic wall. And while at lower speeds, this can give you a good prediction of wall temperature, even in kind of the, the high supersonic regime. As soon as you start moving into the hypersonic regime, the wall temperatures grow to kind of non-physical amounts because you're not capturing um, radiated black body radiation from the wall to tend to cool it, right? You can kind of see that divergence in the plot of stagnation point temperature for um, a cylinder at various Mach numbers to the left. Similarly, um, you know, in hypersonic flight, you typically never have an isothermal wall unless you somehow have some very efficient active cooling system, which is feasible for vehicles. Um, so at right, I just want to show uh, a 1D transient through the thickness conduction simulation I did for the temperature profile of an LI900 tile. So that's the space shuttle, the silicon glass composite tile. And you can see after 10 seconds of exposure to various heating rates, you get up to wall temperatures that range from you know, 1600 Kelvin all the way to you know, 450, you know, 400 Kelvin, um, even for really, really small heat loads. Um, and so if you're using an isothermal cold wall assumption, you're going to typically overestimate the heat flux that you would tend to get there. Um, and so you know, these neglect the fact that the wall temperature and heat flux are coupled by physical processes occurring at the wall. And a more complex treatment of the surface energy balance will need to um, capture these quantities that we're interested in um, more precisely. So we can talk about kind of the general surface energy balance for a flow in hypersonic flight. Um, and you have a couple of contributions to energy transport at the wall. These include a conductive component, which is Fourier's law, right? Um, as well as diffusive component, which is due to um, species gradients at the wall. This is typically associated with catalytic reactions occurring in the wall that, that generate a species gradient and result in enthalpy transport to the wall. Um, you also have a, a radiative component. Here we're looking at um, you know, solely radiative cooling, right? And also you know, shock layers can end up with actually radiative heating, um, but that's kind of outside the, the scope of the work we're looking at. Um, so we're looking at essentially a gray body assumption of radiative cooling from the wall. And then in general, you can also have um, for hypersonic thermal protection systems and a blade of heat transfer from the wall. 
Um, for SG2, of course, we already have this conductive component. Um, and so my talk today is really going to focus on implementations for these two additional components, the diffusive and the radiative contribution. Um, and in all the cases here, we're considering the net conduction into the vehicle to be zero, um, right, which is associated kind of with an insulated lower wall of the surface. Um, and, you know, to solve that fully coupled system would really require an in-depth material response model. Um, and this allows us a good approximation, really, for, for heat flux and for equilibrium wall temperatures. Um, for the cases we're looking at. But of course, that is an area of future work and future interest for kind of the NEMO community. Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit about the catalytic wall, catalytic wall boundary that's been implemented. Um, and the main idea here is that we capture the exothermic recombination of monatomic species and associated flow um, as they impact the wall that can then result in uh, you know, an exothermic reaction leading to heating of the wall. And this is really significant in highly dissociated flows, even moderately dissociated flows, even if flight conditions are relatively low. I'll show that in kind of one of the validation cases that we do here. Um, we use a phenomenological model, and really there's two models that we've implemented in SU2. One is the supercatalytic wall model, which assumes full recombination of all monotonic species that have been involved in their diet, uh, homonuclear dioxides. So that includes you know, um, dissociated oxygen going into O2, dissociated nitrogen going into N2. Um, for like an air vibe flow. Um, but we also have a specified reaction efficiency or, or gamma model, as it's called in the literature, where the degree of recombination is specified by a parameter gamma, and uh, the implementation is a net um, diffusive flux of the species from the wall um, that's dependent essentially on the um, concentration um, at the wall. Uh, so one of the validation cases we looked at for the catalytic wall is the um, uh, Calorimeter in the hypersonic material environmental test system, which is an arc jet at NASA Langley. Um, and we validated against stagnation point heat flux measurements uh, that were uh, reported by Splinter. Um, the idea of uh, the HIMATS, right, is that it's an arc jet. Uh, there is a uh, probe that's inserted into a high energy flow. Uh, and you can kind of see the attached bow shock, the shooting attached bow shock at the front um, in front of the probe. Um, and we're looking at essentially the heating measurements that were obtained over the surface of the probe. Um, and different uh, slug calorimeters with different catalytic efficiencies, they used a, a Teflon and a copper um, calorimeter, were used, which kind of promote varying degrees of recombination on the surface. Um, so uh, I, I won't go into too much detail here, but we, we simulated the uh, nozzle of the arc jet, and then we used those conditions to inform the test case. Here's the model contours I'm showing this slide. Um, and we were able to run a comparison of our heat flux prediction against experimental results and also against the uh, validated hypersonic uh, code of Lamont from the University of Michigan. So um, these plots show the heat flux profile over the slug face. So you can think about it if you go back to the previous slide, we're looking along kind of the radial coordinate um, of the slug calorimeter. Um, and at the non catalytic, so in the Teflon uh, probe, the Lamans and SG2 profiles agree pretty closely, um, and they're both right on the edge of the experimental uncertainty that we found from um, the experiment. Um, for the super catalytic case, which is uh, assuming full recombination, um, there's a little bit more of a discrepancy between the SG2 and the Lamans results, but we're both within the experimental uncertainty measure at the stagnation point of the probe. Um, on the right hand side is a figure showing uh, results from our special type reaction efficiency model. So this is um, heat flux profiles for. Uh, Catalytic efficiencies of um, 0.01, so 1%, 10%, and then 100%, um, which you can see kind of range between the bounds of the non catalytic and super catalytic flow. Um, so, the other uh, boundary that we want to talk about here is a radiated equilibrium. Um, and this gives us a, essentially a conservative approximation of wall temperature um, if we assume a balance between our convective or convective uh, uh, diffusive heating and radiated cooling. Uh, it's parameterized by emissivity, e, uh, epsilon, which is a property of material, and it really controls the proportion of the radiated emission from the surface. Um, and as I said, this really can implicitly define a wall temperature. Um, you can do this you know, by using kind of an explicit root finding method to solve the wall temperature. Um, within SG2, though, we're just implementing this energy balance within the viscous residual boundary, um, and then that converges the wall temperature to the desired result. Um, so, uh, we started this just in the, the perfect gas um, portion of the code, so um, we're working on implementing it in NEMO right now, but uh, under um, a Mach 7, so 
relatively known flow model where we work in um, wedge over a 10 degree cone, we looked at the effect of different emissivity values on the equilibrium wall temperature found. And um, as you'd expect, where heat flux is highest, right at the kind of um, beginning of the cone, uh, you see large peak temperatures, um, which then tend to relax over the surface as you're, you're mainly dominated by the uh, convective heating and boundary. Um, and then, so this uh, test case is a little bit to demonstrate the couple of these uh, different physical mechanisms. Um, I'll talk about this in a second, but one of the kind of four work items here is um, implementing these all in an efficient way within the boundary condition structure um, so that you can choose to include all or some portion of the physical models. Um, but so here we're kind of demonstrating a loose coupling. So this is looking at the effective temperature on the catalytic wall heat flux for a cylinder in cross flow. Uh, this is just a nitrogen flow at Mach 15. Um, and we looked at uh, uh, cylinders, isothermal wall boundaries with um, two different temperatures, uh, 300 Kelvin and 2000 Kelvin. And 2000 Kelvin is um, essentially the rated equilibrium structure you find for uh, a cylinder in, in this condition due to stagnation point heating. Um, you can see that uh, in, in the right hand figure, the flow is has a high degree of association um, for, for nitrogen specifically, since it's so ultra negative. Um, with you know peak concentrations of monatomic nitrogen about eight percent in the flow, and that's directly behind the batch off, as you'd expect. Um, so then we looked at uh, the effect of this temperature on the contribution of catalytic heating to the overall heat flux. So left is the cylinder surface heating rate for a wall temperature of 300 Kelvin, and you can see that there's very little difference between the non-catalytic. And that's largely due to the fact that with such a low isothermal wall temperature the um, contribution from just uh, conduction of the temperature gradient of the surface is, is so significant that it kind of overpowers the catalytic heating computation. So you maybe get something on the order of like a, a 5 percent computation. However, in a more realistic wall temperature, 2000 Kelvin, um, there's a you know, nearly a 50% difference between the peak values for the non-catalytic and the fully catalytic rates. Um, and again, this is, this is largely due to the fact that the uh, Heating due to the integration of the surface is a smaller overall contribution due to the hot wall. Um, so the effects of catalysis become much more significant uh, in, this, in this computation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit through um, conclusions and future work from this. Um, we've looked at you know, accurate prediction of surface temperature and heat flux and hypersonic flows for a couple of different um, conditions. And you know, what we find is that this really requires the inclusion of additional physics into the surface energy balance. Um, the initial results really demonstrate the utility of the catalytic and radiative boundary conditions in obtaining accurate, in this case, cold wall heat flux and wall temperature, respectively, for two different conditions. Um, but there's a ton of future work in this area. And, you know, I think first and foremost is just continued verification and validation. We're continuing to look for additional validation cases for the um, catalytic wall boundary and for validation cases for the radiative wall boundary. Um, we're also interested in you know, inclusion in, in my perspective of kind of the development timeline and non charring operation boundary conditions to complete this surface energy balance. And of course, coupling the models within the S2 framework so that you're not having to run single simulations with these different boundaries. And, and we want to find a really efficient way to do that in the S2 product line so that you're not duplicating a lot of code or trying to um, essentially rewrite um, full kind of solvers that way. Um, so that kind of concludes my talk. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. So obviously I just want to acknowledge the SUT Nemo working group who uh, have been you know, really helpful in this and you to support the code. Um, and then I'm funded by uh, AFOSR. So, yes, happy to take any questions and thank you again for listening to my talk. Thank you. Very good timing. So we have uh, time for questions. Please. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, just repeating the question. The question is referring to the formula used to evaluate the heat flux due to the thermal radiation that only have the, the fourth power of the wall temperature and then doesn't have the uh, free stream external temperature. Is it correct? Yeah, no, that's a good question. In this case, you may be on assumption that you have the radiation. 
Any other questions? Anyone from, from the audience? Uh, sorry, from the remote. Maybe I have one question. If you can go uh, to the final slide where you're showing. Yes, so yeah. this one. So in this case, you are not accounting for the uh, radiation extract, right? I'm, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. That, that yeah. is definitely. So the idea is I, I took the 2,000 Kelvin from that plot I showed earlier, radiated, radiated lower end temperature for stagnation uh, for a cylinder, and then we applied that over the entire surface boundary. But yes, ideally we'd like to get to the point where uh, both radiative and uh, you know, catalytic and convective heating are all coupled within the same simulation. Sure. No, no, that, that is fine. Okay. So these contours are from the solution with the catalytic. Yes, these are with the kind of the, um, the, you know, the, the simulations are very, very similar. The only difference you see is like within you know, a very close region within the boundary, like, um, there's a slight difference in the grade level. Significant difference in the grade, but it's really small. And, 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 so. Okay. Yeah. 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 But, so I assume then uh, you had to derive some Jacobians for the implicit schemes for these uh, boundary conditions, or? These were actually all random was it? <laughs> that's also on the two list. All right, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that. Implicit is coming. Yeah. yeah. It's on his way. Yeah. Like Santa. <laughs> 